suppose I prepare um, 10 atoms, n equals to 10, just, just, just so that it's easy to discuss. If I got 10 atoms, each one of those 10 atoms are independent of each other. Mm -hmm. so, so each atom you measure, there's uncertainty due to you know, Heisenberg uncertainty principle. You can think of this as fictitious angular momentum as a uh, non-permutation between Jx, Jy, and Jz from that language. Or you can from the measurement postulate whenever you have a coherent superposition of two states. And when you make a measurement, you never know which state is going to come out. Right? This is a fundamental indeterminism in quantum. And that gives rise to each, each atom where you make a measurement. There's this uncertainty limited by that. Now you make a 10 copies of such measurements. You have a 10 times more signal, but you also have 10 times more noise. The noise scales as a square root of, mm -hmm. of the 10 measurements. So that's where the square root of n come from. It's like statistics noise. Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a white noise. You make more measurements, the noise go down as a square root of the sample. So, so signal scales with n, noise scales with square root of n, the signal to noise ratio squares with n over square root of n. That's why the square root of n comes from. Now, with the, if in the entanglement, you can think of the following picture. When I have 10 atoms actually entangled in the best case scenario is that the entanglement means your fluctuation will dictate mine or our fluctuation are adjoined. So even though I have 10 atoms, there's only really one copy of fluctuation because they are entangled. So from that perspective, you have 10 copies of signal, you only have one copy of noise. It sounds like close to this uh, uh, kind of redundant or quantum error correction approach. Is it something? This is different. This is just telling you that because of the entanglement, I mean, in some sense, in quantum mechanics, you can think of the most deeply profound aspect of a quantum mechanics is, the, is this Heisenberg uncertainty principle. Mm -hmm. The wave function and so on, and in some ways, in classical physics, we have wave functions, right? Um, you know, so interference and so on. The, 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 I think the most intriguing aspect of quantum mechanics that people always find puzzling, one is superposition. They can have the two different locations at the same mm -hmm. time. And that associated with that uh, is that, is that you know, when you make a measurement, there's always the state collapsing. You know, however you want to be, to interpret the quantum mechanics, there's nevertheless the practical consequence is the, is the noise. And that noise is the most fundamental aspect of quantum. And it, no classical physics has this indeterminism. And so in, in some sense, it's kind of funny that you know, I always talk about this way. In clocks, we use quantum certainty principle where energy states are eigenstates of Hamiltonian. So therefore, it's absolutely certain what energy level you're going to measure. But it is uncertainty because you prepare a superposition between two states. And you, when, you, when you make a measurement, there's uncertainty building. Mm -hmm. it's, quantum gives this yin and yang, this, this mm -hmm. co intrinsically conflict, but it's beautiful com combination, right? And, and it, what is entanglement doing to us is, well, if I can have a two different quantum particles to be completely entangled, meaning they are, they are intrinsically fluctuating, and that fluctuation is not something you can control. But, but the two particles as a whole, they, they are, their fluctuation is completely correlated well beyond what classical correlation can describe. And this quantum entanglement, quantum correlation, makes the quantum fluctuation to be only one copy, as I, even though you have two different independent particles. And that's a very key aspect of quantum mechanics. It also lies in how you process information. But it's a quantum, no, quantum computer is using exactly the same protocol. Quantum communication is using exactly the same protocol. It's this correlated cold, noise. That's the aspect that is no counterpart in classical physics. So it's like a really intriguing that quantum gives you this inescapable noise, but somehow you can make entanglement such that, yeah, let's make the inescapable noise to be as small as possible by entangling all the particles. Or if you want to entangle all the particles, maybe you can share information well beyond when anybody who break them apart, you have two independent noise process. And therefore, they can no longer hear what you are trying to communicate. 
between the tangled. So oh. those like correlations, they make it more prone to to noise and yeah, exactly. Well, sorry, protect, not less to protect from the noise against yeah, noise. Prone. Yeah, I see. yeah. So so that that aspect um, is really important, and and the I think this is really the the fundamental key that we are starting to try to take advantage of in the second quantum revolution, and that's why whether it's quantum computing, quantum information processing, quantum communication, or quantum metrology, as we are discussing today, it's the same thing. It's the same deal that we are trying to take advantage of. So to me, you know, this quantum scaling up on one hand is to use as many particles as possible in the pristine quantum states. And that gives you a square root of n scaling. And in the future, you put it in quantum entanglement, that's a law of n scaling that's even more powerful. But regardless, you need more and more particles. You need to make n large. Yeah, touching based on like quantum computing, so it seems like uh, it's kind of one of the branches from uh, optical atomic clocks. I would say like in general uh, atomic clocks. So what's your what's your view on uh, uh, kind of the current uh, things which happen with like quantum computing? Like, yeah, I think uh, I think the the in on many ways the quantum metrology like atomic clock provides a lot of a technology for quantum computer. Um, the qubit has to be rotated very precisely, and in fact, you want to do so-called deep circuits. You want to rotate the qubits many many times. You want to have hugely incoherent uh, sort of evolution. Your coherence time must be lot much longer than the individual manipulation time or individual evolution time or gate entanglement time. So they can do multiple calculation steps, which is also called deep circuits. And so, so on one hand, the metrology, quantum metrology really provides underpinning technology platforms for quantum computers. So it's and, like improving fidelities of the gates yeah. because it's all noise dependent for Samson. example yeah and all the tools they're developing the lasers we're talking about lasers if you want to use optical qubits you know laser is the one of the key fundamental piece of technology and so that that's that but on the other hand there's also a very deep connection when you have oh i can generate ghz states i can do error corrections i can do you know quantum algorithm on the fly i do think this will come back and then do optimization on the clocks and so in my mind, you know, this field is going to, quantum metrology also has this connection to fundamental physics. So as, as we briefly mentioned, as the clock gets better and better, you can probe the interface between quantum and, and uh, gravitational physics. You can use this to search for unknown physics that we, we know that the, the standard model is not a complete. And so from that perspective, I find it super exciting where quantum information science will make a clock better just because of the technology flows both ways, but also intellectual connection. Like how do you make, make a better measurements, make a better protocols, make a, take a resource off a lot of a quantum entanglement, correct all the mistakes you might make along the way, the systematic errors and so on. And that will make you, I think, continue to make a huge progress. Over the past 20 years, we improved our clock by five orders of magnitude. And this, this will still continue to improve in my mind, and, and it will be connected to the overall advancement of the entire field of quantum science, and then connects to fundamental science. I think that's where potentially we'll have discoveries in the coming decade.